So I don't know exactly what type of talk this is, whether it's mathematics, philosophy. I thought of it as psychology, but it doesn't go very far in psychology. <laughs> but both Duncan Luce and I and Jean-Claude think that we're doing things that will ultimately benefit psychology. And, um, uh, and we have psychological examples we could present uh, uh, psychological applications, but the theory is cleanest when we talk about physics or mathematics and the ideas uh, work best there. But the real application, I think, in the future will be to the behavioral sciences from the type of work we're doing. Let's see, I press this one. This one. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, begin with the Klein Erlangen program. It's from 1872. Felix Klein was um, a mathematician and he worked in geometry and he synthesizes various ideas that they had about what group theory was and geometry starting from about uh, 1802. And what they did was they didn't have mathematical logic. So they didn't have logic. Well, they had Aristotelian logic, which didn't get very far. And what they wanted to do was talk about how to make inferences of a certain sort in mathematics. Today, I'll show you that we can maybe reduce it to logic by using group theory, which was the type of uh, uh, thing they understood to use. And uh, so I will mainly focus on the inference uh, part of it. Um, so first we'll talk about invariance, and I'll have it set up in a particular way. So you consider y to be a set of points in the Euclidean plane. Then each line on the plane is a non-empty subset of y. So we're looking at lines as being subsets of points. This is not how geometers looked at lines, but for our purposes, since we can bring in symmetry, it's important that we look at we have an underlying set of atoms, so to speak, that we're going to permute, and then we're going to look at what is invariant. So uh, then L is a set of lines, and L corresponds to the Euclidean concept of lines. It's a non-empty set of subsets of Y. Let H be a group of rotations about the points of Y of, y, of a particular point in Y, so you're taking a rotation. The elements of H takes lines into lines, that is for each H and H, H of, a, uh, of the set of lines go into the set of lines. And so H is a higher order invariant. Each line isn't invariant. So we have to go up to very abstract levels just to get something simple once we do this group theory part. Colleagues in philosophy have sort of a tradition not to go up to things that are abstract because they don't think of them as being empirical. They like to just look at relations on points that they can run experiments on or see. But we have to go up to various abstract levels. And mathematicians go up to infinitely high abstract levels. And logicians go up to levels beyond that. <clears throat> so the Erlanger program that um, Felix Klein had going on, there was two types of geometries at the time. There was analytic geometry that we do in high school or college, where we have the Euclidean plane as a set of ordered pair of points, and we call a line something satisfying the equation, a linear equation, a circle satisfies a different equation, and we call that a Euclidean geometry if it satisfies the Euclidean metric, right, which is an algebraic formula. But then there's the Euclidean geometry of Euclid, where you have lines and points, and you can have congruences where you move, and you have triangle, side, angle, tri side that you move around. That's a very different kind of geometry. But of course, they both are the same geometry. In what sense are they the same geometry? And this is what uh, uh, Klein was interested in. And it goes back to an ancient problem about what is geometry. So geometry for Plato was things that you 
had in Euclid that you made out of lines and circles. But around his time, there was people who looked at conic sections, which are not made out of lines and circles. You have a three-dimensional thing, and you slice it, and then you go to two dimensions. And they had other sorts of things. You hang a, a rope, and it's a type of curve. And, um, and you could do geometries of it. Later, when you had um, uh, Archimedes, you had the Archimedean spiral that basically is a log or exponential function, or how you ever want to look at it. Um, so you have um, lots of different things, curves. And Plato thought that some were geometric and others were not. Somewhere he called them material and ugly and whatever. Geometric ones were beautiful and perfect. Descartes came around and did analytic geometry, not the way we did it, you start with regular geometry and you introduce the coordinate systems within the geometry as constructions. And then you do your analytic part. So he thought, yes, parabolas and ellipses were geometric, but uh, Archimedes' spiral was not. And he developed the difference between an algebraic curve and a transcendental curve and all sorts of other ideas. So there was a debate about what is really belonging to geometry. Because once we get to analytic geometry, we can write down any formula and get any curve, and some just don't make sense, or didn't seem to make sense in curves. So Klein decided he would solve this problem, and the way he solved the problem was going to symmetry groups. So he identified geometries with transformation groups and two geometric structures, either synthetic, that meant it had intuitive concept content as a geometry, or analytic, it was just a bunch of equations, are said to specify the same geometry if and only if they have isomorphic transformation groups. And the Erlanger program also identify invariants with geometric entities. An entity is invariant if and only if it's geometric. And this worked. I mean, it, uh, it led people to develop new geometries. So part of the problem in the 19th century was someone coming up with a group, and then someone else now wants to find the synthetic geometry that matches the group. Give me points, tell me what the points are, tell me what the lines are, and give me some sort of geometric meaning going with the group. And there's a lot of research on that. And, um, but they also did other things. If you know that two geometries have what it means for two different versions of the same geometry to be, quote, the same geometry, two different structures. They can look very different in terms of the primitives that you axiomatize them in, but they could have the same symmetry groups, and they were the same geometry. And this is where the mathematical logic was maybe missing. Today we would say, well, you have these two sets of primitives, what does it mean? I take one set of primitives and I can define in a precise way, all the other primitives of the second system and vice versa, and show that the axioms of the first one transform when I do the definition, and then they're the same. That would have captured a lot of things of the Erlanger program, but they didn't have a concept of what definability was sufficiently strong to accomplish that as a formal idea. Also, the Erlanger program was stronger than that. Because for us to do that, we have to stay within countable languages, right? And so the only things we can define are things that have countably many predicates in our language, the way we talk about definitions. But you can show that there are infinitely, a uh, very high cardinality of Euclidean geometries that have different sets of primitives. So from our version of Euclidean geometry, we can't get all the others. It was the elephant problem that you had before. You have an alien civilization. They have a Euclidean ge geometry, different set of primitives because they're insects or whatever. We have a set of primitives, and we can't interdefine them because we have our languages the way we do it. They have their languages. And you can't interdefine them, but they both have the same symmetry group, right? 
They both know that they have the same, they both can talk about their symmetry groups, but they can't necessarily see one symmetry group to the other. <clears throat> so um, uh, that presents a problem. So synthetic geometries have a bunch of primitives, point, line, circle for Euclidean geometry, point, line, perpendicularity for another geometry, strange idea of a solid by itself that Tarski came up with that doesn't have points or lines, and another uh, geometry. There's all sorts of ways that you find a Euclidean geometry. And with each of these, there's the transformation group that leaves the primitives invariant. Okay, so these are standard notions. <clears throat> so the axioms about the primitives, if we write axioms like Euclidean geometry, it tells us what the transformation group is. We can determine it. If we have a transformation group, and we have a bunch of primitives that the transformation group is on, the problem is to write down the right set of axioms. That was that thing I mentioned that they did in the 19th century. <clears throat> okay, so we have this. Okay, so here's the summary. A, a, a geometry is a transformation group on a non-empty set. Why? There's relations, there's points, there's lines, there's a line, there's sets of lines, there's sets and sets of lines, and we go on up, it's higher order relations. And those that remain invariant under the transformations belong to the geometry, and those that are not invariant, does not belong to the geometry. And generalizing the Erlanger program to science, rather than saying a geometry will become, we'll call it meaningful. It's just, we're not talking about geometries anymore necessarily, we're talking about science. We don't want to say, use the word geometric. Although Klein would have been inclined to say, if you had a good symmetry group in science, it's really a geometry. But uh, we won't necessarily say we should have a synthetic uh, one that correlates with it. And we'll just use the word meaningful for that. So there's two gaps in the Erlanger program. And when you go to the literature and you read about it, it's the Erlanger program is still around, the mathematicians still write about it. It's like one of the great ideas in mathematics. It organized uh, geometry and had, as we'll talk about, had enormous impact in physics. Um, but there was these great gaps, at least I see the gaps, and when you read about them, they try, some people try to talk about the gaps, but they don't do very well. So first gap is, why should invariants belong to the geometry? Why does, if we're gonna have Euclidean geometry, what's the relationship? It's a definition in Klein, right? But why should invariants be so important? Why should they be geometrical? It works out that they are geometrical, but why? Right, that's kind of missing in a gap. It's a gap because they talk about it, but they're worse than philosophers when mathematicians talk about such things. So, um, uh, uh, so that's the first thing. So I would like to fill that gap. And the second one is, um, uh, what about the case where you have only the trivial group? If you only have the trivial group, the identity of the only symmetry, then everything is meaningful and everything is geometric. Well, maybe that is philosophically the right view, but for practical purposes, it's a useless concept, right? Uh, it, it comes out to be somehow related to the first one. What happens when you only have this? And we'll get to an example of this. Um, in a second. So what I wanted to do is uh, think about things uh, a bit differently. I don't have time to go into how I got here, got to this place, but basically it was looking at the Erlanger program as making inferences. In, the, 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 in physics, it's used all over the place to make inferences, to derive laws and think about things. And there's something called dimensional analysis 
which Duncan Luce showed was equivalent to the Erlanger program when he did it, a, uh, when he worked out exactly what the measurement theory of physical dimensions consists of. <clears throat> so it's used for making all sorts of inferences as well. And I wanted to go, and also Luce and I, and John claude and Jeff, and others, <laughs> uh, use it for making inferences and doing psychology. Uh, and, um, but I can't really go into it, but I decided I'll journalize what its use is, how it gets used, and I call it a scientific topic. And this will correspond to what Klein called a geometry. What does it mean for something to belong to a geometry? But I'll bring in some ideas out of logic. The principle one is the domain of a scientific topic is a set X, like the set of points in Euclidean space. The scientific topic is determined by a structure of primitives, like, you know, concepts of lines and circles and things like that in geometry. The structure of primitives and each of its primitives belong to a scientific topic. So a scientific topic, all those primitives belong to it, but also the scientific topic itself. And the fourth principle is that scientific topic is closed under scientific definition. That is, if a bunch of uh, B1 to Bn, a bunch of objects or entities belong to the topic, and B is appropriately scientifically defined in terms of the topic, then B belongs to the scientific topic. Now, I have to say what scientifically defined is, and that is a, a real key sort of thing. And in the philosophy of science, this is what gets debated, not in a sort of formal way like I'm going to do now, in a clear way stating what the problem is, but it gets debated <laughs> what really belongs to a scientific topic. And the principle five is, whoop, I have five here, a portion of pure mathematics can be used in scientific definitions. After all, if we're doing science, we use mathematics. I can use the number two, or I can use the number pi and throw it into the definition. Because why? We do that all the time. I can give a deeper reason why, <laughs> but I have to go and talk about what mathematics is and how mathematics get related to all of this, and that's a different topic. For this conference, it all has to do with symmetries. The number two could be a type of symmetry. It could be a ratio of two physical measurements. And that's a, uh, a number because in physical measurements, the scale cancels out. And we can use that. But I have to go into what numbers is. But in principle, we could use a portion of pure mathematics in it. And this is what science does. So a scientific topic, this matches what I see if I take a something in the scientific literature, our biology, social science, or physics, so far. We can talk about the portion of mathematics. So a full scientific topic, I have the structure of primitives. And the portion of mathematics, I'll say all of pure mathematics. Now, this could be debatable. You might want computable mathematics. You might want observable mathematics, like those ratios I'm talking about of measurements. You could talk and you could argue about how much mathematics you want, but I'm going to take all of mathematics uh, because this is what we do in science. People don't seem to question very much using all of mathematics. Mathematics is infinitistic, involves higher levels, infinity even. We do measure theory and all of this without considering a part of our science. And on the other hand, we want our science to be positivistic, in, at least in the experimental side. And how do you relate the uh, metaphysics of doing a positivistic-like um, uh, uh, experimental science with a heavily metaphysical mathematics? Right? This is a type of problem for philosophers. Carnap, who uh, was mentioned. Uh, I was at a conference where this came about, where Carnap was being pushed to say whether or not the set of natural numbers existed. 
he was pushed real hard, and he realized he was trapped, so he finally said, yes, the set of natural numbers existed, but he obviously didn't like it. <laughs> so, uh, so the language I'll use is an infantry higher order logic. We need, we're doing higher order things to begin with, so we need higher lo logic. Everything I'm talking about can be done in second order logic, if you know what that is, but, and, but we'll just take Principia Mathematica and everything because we want to capture the Klein Erlanger program. Okay, and um, or we can use formulas of set theory. We can start with a set of atoms and take a very formal approach of all of this. <clears throat> okay, so scientific topics of symmetry uh, invariance. So we have a structure of primitives. And then we have a higher order relation based on X belongs to the full scientific topic determined by X if and only if it's invariant under the symmetries of X. Okay, so this is what I uh, um, are basically going to show. Okay, and then from this type of theorem, the Erlanger program is generalized by weakening the language for scientific uh, definitions by allowing a smaller portion of, so by, if we want to generalize, so here's the Erlanger program. Let me see, did I put in this other one? Not yet, okay. So if we want to generalize the Erlanger program, if we have a theorem like this theorem, then what happens is we can weaken the language of a scientific definition. And if we weaken it, then if we have a single invariant, we have only the identity, we can't get everything. Or we can uh, allow a smaller portion of pure mathematics to be used. After all, if I don't let any pure mathematics being used, the number of formulas I have is countable, so I have only countably many entities I can talk about, and of course there's more than countably many entities that are meaningful. So, uh, um, if we're, like if we're doing geometry, maybe, if we had the identity as the only thing and we had a continuum, each point would be meaningful and you can't define all points, right? So, um, or we can do both one and two. So we have all sorts of ways of generalizing the Erlanger program. So the Erlanger program is equivalent to a notion of scientific definability. Okay, so I showed the equivalence, and then I could generalize the Erlanger program by doing this. Well, you might say, well, why not generalize the Erlanger program by generalizing the concept of a group? And this has been done for, or tried, let's say, for over 100 years, and have failed. I can explain exactly, yeah, come on. So why not generalize it, generalize it by using a some definition of computability, like recursive number theory, for example. Well, that's, this, this is allowing a smaller portion of mathematics. Right. Right. But, it, but, but if you want to just say generalize it by using re, recursive, um, uh, 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 okay, recursive number theory, and then what happens, you have the transformations. Well... Because that seems to be very easy to do. It's easy to do, but you lose physics. Uh, we'll lose the important applications. So we have all these important applications where you have only the trivial automorphisms, that what you want to do. Now, what are the important applications you want to talk about where this generalization would actually help? So we can always generalize lots of ways and get nice theorems, but what we want to do is improve our science. So this is where we differ from some philosophers, not in our logic, and not in our LPS department here, but Jean-Claude, me, and Duncan Luce, our interest was to improve psychology by bringing these ideas in. And what happens is we did not have the rich symmetry groups that they had in, in physics. And so even though the ideas transfer in very small, narrow areas of psychophysics, 
they don't transfer overall to psychology, right? So we wanted to look at what was happening in physics and generalize it in such a way that we can improve things in psychology. So uh, uh, we weren't, weren't about, we're not, none of us were philosophers. <laughs> we, uh, that's what I meant. It's just that our field doesn't appreciate us. <laughs> Yet, <laughs> but it could change. <clears throat> okay, so um, so let me. Uh, uh, so let me uh, show you uh, uh, how I a uh, very simple case how you use this as inference. This is something that uh, John Claude in his talk has done, in his talk, and uh, uh, Luce and I both have thought about this. Consider a situation where by extra scientific means, intuitive experience, as psychologists we can maybe talk about this in the meta language, a scientist is led to believe that a function z equals f of x, y that he needs to describe from a subset of x uh, from a on to itself, a binary function, is determined by the observable first order relations r1 to rn on a. Typical thing in science. You observe some things and you think that your variables are related by a function. How do you know your variables are related by a function? It doesn't follow from how x and y are related, but you think it belongs to the scientific topic. You think you really understand what's going on and you have it fixed. It should follow from that. Then it's reasonable for scientists to proceed on a hypothesis that f belongs to the scientific content of the relational structure x, r1 to rn, which for this discussion can be, uh, be taken as determined by the full scientific topic. Okay? So it belongs to the topic. This is an assumption you're making. The scientist assumes F has a scientific definition in terms of X and its primitives, because that's what it means to belong to the scientific content of it. If not, then you have to add something more, another primitive, some other rules, or something. By a previous theorem, the one I stated before, F is invariant under the symmetries of X. So we know it's invariant by a theorem here. <clears throat> Suppose the scientist knows enough about X and has a mathematical scale to determine the symmetry group of X. And that's why I say there's Jeff, John Claude, me, and Duncan in psychology. <laughs> Not too many other people. This part about being determined the symmetry group or even know what a symmetry group is. Then by methods of analyses involving symmetries may be employed to provide information in characterizing F. John claude gave a nice talk about how to do this in some cases. There are several methods in the literature for accomplishing this. Okay. So what happens is, um, so we know, what the, we know what the symmetry group is. And now we know that this function f has to be invariant under the symmetry group. And we have these techniques. What do we know? We know the things. There's lots of possible f's. But the ones that are not invariant, we don't have to consider. If we're really lucky, there will be one <laughs> that is uniquely determined. And that will be our law. But even if there's more than one, we'll get a very small subset that are determined because it's very hard to be invariant under a symmetry group. So that's the idea of... Uh... So note in the above process that the scientific definability is used to justify F belonging to the appropriate topic. And invariance is used as a mathematical technique. Now it's a, because now it's a theorem, it's not a theoretical technique, to find helpful information in characterizing F. And these two uses are connected by a theorem of mathematical logic. Also note that the scientist's belief that F belonged to the topic generated by X is extra scientific. 
Therefore, the deduction based on information obtained through the above process should be either checked by experiment or derived by accepted scientific theory and facts. It's a lot easier when you know what the solution is to derive it <laughs> and, uh, because it becomes a mathematical problem. You just give it to some guy in mathematics or you do an experiment to check it. Okay, so this is how it's used as an inference. This is a very simple case. We have much more sophisticated ways of doing it. And so this bridges ideas uh, how physics have used invariance to bring it over to uh, psychology. And that's a, so, so I might as well go on. Uh, for the purpose of science, the bub process is a process is a method of generating hypotheses, not facts. If the, ex if the scientific scientists' extra scientific beliefs are correct, then the generated hypothesis will be facts. However, the scientist has no scientific guarantee that his beliefs are correct. So, okay. So you're going to do the generalization of, of the Erlanger program. The Erlanger program implies the invariance form a full scientific topic. So these are actual theorems. The other one was the main characterizing theorem. The full scientific topic does not imply that each invariant is scientific definable, does not imply the Erlanger program. What is missing? An assumption is missing to get that. What is missing is this assumption, that if I add the full scientific topic. If each element of a set A is scientifically definable, then A is scientifically definable. This seems like a reasonable principle, but it's basically the axiom in set theory, it's like the axiom of choice. In set theory, you need principles to go and take a whole bunch of entities and bring them together as a set. And we have various ways of bringing them together. One is by defining something as a set, that's our scientific definability, that's one way of bringing them together. Another way is say what it means for it to exist as a set. And this is an existence one. If I have a set, it's already out there in our platonic universe, but does it belong to a scientific topic? Well, if each of the elements does, then it does. It's an existence one, not a definition one. And it turns out to have played the same role as the axiom of choice in set theory, and I can uh, talk a lot about that particular issue. So <clears throat> the full scientific topic plus meaningful heritability implies the scientific topic is a, a version of set theory's axiom of choice. If I add this into uh, the system, then I get consequences that are only obtainable by the axiom of choice belonging to a full scientific topic. So if we're doing measure, measure theory, I get non-measurable sets belonging to a scientific topic. If I leave that axiom out, then I can do all of physics and all of everything and not worry about non-measurable sets, which makes proving theorems much easier because everything is measurable. You never have to prove something that's measurable. But, um, uh, but those are meta theorems. Okay, so full scientific topic plus meaningful heritability is equivalent to the Erlanger program. So the Erlanger program has something really intrinsically empathistic in it that is you may not want in science. So Einstein's theory of relativity. Special relativity came in in 1905 and it fit into the Erlanger program. Klein was very happy. The general theory came in 1907 to 15, a series of papers, and every entity in the general theory is geometric, that is meaningful because there is a single uh, automorphism, a, a single symmetry. So what is the real problem here? The problem here is the Erlanger program failed for general theory of relativity. Klein originally said that Differential geometry did not belong, wasn't the geometry, was doing analysis. Einstein uses uh, differential geometry, and nobody's going to say that physical space should not be a geometry, so the Erlanger program collapsed at 
this particular point. French mathematicians in particular tried to revive it by generalizing the notion of symmetry. So symmetry is like an automorphism. They went to, or they went to notions like various kinds of partial symmetry. And it works partially, but you don't recover all the grand things you can do in the Erlanger program, particularly these inferences. You can't recover any of those, and uh, it never worked out very well. So what I have is other sorts of concepts. So here's one that I'll talk about, which is intrinsicness. And this is really uh, uh, invariance under context. A very general thing that I've been working on and, and, uh, for the last few years. Uh, quantum mechanics fits well into uh, this line of thinking about contextual uh, types of uh, thinking as throughout psychology. Consider a case where you have an empirical structure that could be put into various contexts. Well, you, put the, you change contexts, you change the primitives a little bit, and they go around. But let's say you don't change the primitives so much that an n area relation becomes an n minus 1 area relation. All the relations remain the same. You have a set of contexts. If all the relations are the same, then what happens is you have a language that can apply to all the contexts. So the symmetry here is at the meta-language level, or the meta-level, because we put a language on. The language can apply to all the contexts. And then we look at, given that language, we look at what a scientific definition is, but you have to now have a formula that um, uh, remains invariant across contexts. This is sort of like a very natural way of looking at it. If all the contexts form a group, then you're in a similar thing to the Erlanger program. You're more like the Einstein's theory of special relativity, where the contexts are like frames. Things change, but don't change dramatically. Somehow, there's a universal language you can apply to each of the frames in relativity theory. Some things are invariant across frames, like the calculation of the speed of light in each frame. And you can formulate ideas like that. And you have the Lorentz group. Well, that's nice, but in psychology, we're not going to have groups for a con. And once again, except for maybe psychophysics, we might, we're going to have uh, maybe groups, but we may not have too much in the way of groups, but you don't need a lot in the way of groups. You just need this invariant under contexts. They don't necessarily form a group. And we have a particularly uh, good information. So under this sort of thing, intrinsicness itself becomes a scientific topic. It's the scientific topic that is important, and you can carry out the same types of inferences and whatever that we do with scientific topics. Okay, so this is a way of kind of looking at it. Now, intrinsicness is different than meaningfulness because something can be both meaningful, that's if you take a particular frame being invariant in that frame, Right? Well, simultaneously being invariant across lots of frames. So it's a higher level of invariance. One way of achieving that higher level of invariance is to formulate if all these frames, for example, were, had the same group as their transformation group. So they had isomorphic transformation groups, but they're not related by a group. You may not have inverses. Uh, you might have too few, or for reasons you might want to have too few rather than all possible. You have something like that, but still that gives you an extra level of invariance. A law of laws that John Claude talked about has that type of property. He didn't have structures of primitives. What he had was scales of measurement. And he has how the scales of measurement really corresponds to groups and how these groups were related. And you state something about how the groups related, then a very small amount of qualitative things about the world, and out pops these laws. And that's because there's lawful behavior between groups. Okay. Now, groups itself have subgroups. 
And so bring up a talk from last time. Some of these subgroups are invariant. They're called normal subgroups. And they are especially related to other groups. In the talk last time, talking to the uh, presenter, the people presented the 17 subgroups, what I'm saying was not relevant there. <laughs> or maybe they did not look at the right type of experiment to do. <laughs> because a group in its normal subgroup, there's a very interesting invariant subgroup. There's very interesting types of relationships. And if you find things that connected to those relationships, then you have it. But what I'm getting at is this notion of intrinsicness that I have here, which isn't on the slide, applies to talking about how things are related in terms of subgroups of a bigger group as well. And that gives a higher level of invariance because it doesn't depend upon the particular primitives. Okay? Do you want to wrap up? That's it. Okay, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.